So the lecture is called Secularism, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. Because secularism is indeed encroaching on the culture, that's the step forward, but when we actually examine uh, what is being put forth by them, we see that there's no advantage to that worldview, and so that's two steps back. And let's get right to <coughs> uh, the first point, which is worldviews, and we each have one, okay? Now, a worldview is a view of the world, but you probably already knew that. Did it? Okay. Um, a worldview is like glasses. You put them on, and so now everything I see is filtered through these glasses. And, uh, yeah, in fact, some of you look better with these on, so <laughs> I think I'll uh, go ahead and leave them on. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so the point of a worldview is to be consistent. Absolutely everything I see is filtered through these glasses. I don't have a pair of glasses just to think about politics, then a different one for religion, and a different one for morality, and so on. But one view that makes all my thinking about the whole world and everything in it consistent. And that's the point. Now, it has been noted that, for instance, when an atheist and a Christian looks at a, fla uh, at a rose, they're not seeing the same thing. Now, Shakespeare wrote, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. But when we look at the rose, we're not seeing the same thing. Granted, there is an actual reality there. We all see the stem and the leaves and the petals. But the Christian sees an object created by God, or that actually devolved from whatever God created in the beginning, whereas an atheist sees something that came about by chance mutations and natural selection. So there's a reality there, but the way we view it is through our worldviews. That's what we're seeing. So now the second point is that we're all metaphysicians. That is, we all have a metaphysical point of view. And here's part of a dictionary definition of metaphysics a branch of philosophy that examines the nature of reality, the theory or first principles of a particular discipline, a priori speculation upon questions that are unanswerable to scientific observation, analyses, or experiment. So the point is, at the very bottom of our worldview, that which upon our worldview is actually based or built, or, or the foundation of our, our worldview, is metaphysical, ultimately, because, for instance, somebody says, well, uh, show me evidence for your worldview. Well, I believe this, this, and here's the evidence. Okay, now that. Show me evidence for that evidence. Show me evidence for that evidence. And you keep digging down and down and down and down and down. So you come to a point where the, the very bottom of your worldview is something that they're, they're axioms, they are principles. Okay, the, these are not things that are proven or evidenced, but they're assumed or presupposed. There's only so much evidence you can show for what you believe until you reach a point where there's just nothing but an assumption or a presupposition. Um, and that's for all of us, from the, the wackiest Bible thumper to the most militant atheist. Absolutely everybody has a metaphysical uh, premise at the, as the foundation of their worldview, and that's important to know. As G.K. Chesterton stated, every man of the street must hold a metaphysical system and hold it firmly. The possibility is that he may have held it so firmly and so long as to have forgotten all about its existence. I apologize to the rationalists for even calling them rationalists. They are not rationalists. We all believe in fairy tales and live in them. Some hold to the undemonstrable dogma of the existence of God some the equally undemonstrable dogma of the existence of the man next door. And incidentally, you'd have to spend a tremendous amount of money and years studying philosophy to come to the conclusion that you can't know the person next to you actually exists. But <laughs> that is a real philosophical issue, just so you know. So, how does secularism encroach upon the culture. There are various ways. Think about media, for instance. And we're talking books, magazines, movies, uh, even the news. So think about going to a music store, right? All the mu uh, music is categorized by genre, right? Jazz, rock, hip-hop, country, and then Christian. But I mean, Christian music is categorized by lyrical content. In Christian music, you have all kinds of genres. Isn't that strange? I mean, why don't you have 
all the music categorized by lyrical content. Songs about getting drunk, songs about violence, songs about puppy love, you know. So, <laughs> so you want to so you want to think about these things. Why are, why are these things out there? Why are they put forth in that way? Because there's a worldview behind it. There's a worldview behind how the music is displayed, even. Let's think about the news. For instance, um, you may recall Anders Vervik. He carried out the bombing and shooting rampage, left 92 people dead in uh, Norway's capital in a nearby island. And the news media had a field day. They were so thrilled that they could say, look, a Christian terrorist, Christian terrorist. And it was all over the news, and along with it came reminders of Timothy McVeigh. Oh, another, uh, he was a Christian terrorist too. I mean, the, the media was thrilled to be able to point to them and refer to them as Christian terrorists. And in fact, Dan Barker, who is the co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which, by the way, is an organization established in the USA, which is a country premised upon the concept of freedom of religious expression. So go figure. He stated, Why is no one calling the Oklahoma City bombing suspects quote-unquote Christian terrorists? And he said, Timothy McVeigh, a God-believing Catholic, blew up the federal building. Well, why weren't the, there wasn't the media referring to him as a Christian terrorist. Well, CNN reports, McVeigh's an agnostic. He doesn't believe in God. And the UK Guardian, McVeigh said he was an agnostic, but that he would improvise, adapt, and overcome. And that's why when he requested last rites before his execution, those people who knew him were shocked. I mean, because he did not believe in God, but he apparently adapted. Well, what about Anders? Anders Vervik. He is a Christian in precisely the same way that Richard Dawkins is a Christian. Because they both just so happen to use the term cultural Christian. It means they're not in the least bit Christians. They don't believe in God. But they both see that Christianity plays a beneficial role in society. And so that's why they refer to him as a Christian terrorist. But he is not a Christian. He just called himself a cultural Christian, meaning he saw those benefits in, in society. Now recently, a pastor introducing Rick Perry made reference to Mormonism as a cult. And all oh, the media was all over, all the presidential candidates. Do you think they're a cult? Do you think Mormonism is a cult? Do you think it's a cult? And I was thinking, well, why aren't they asking Mitt Romney or uh, Mormon leaders, pray tell, what is the very purpose of your religion? I mean, how did it start? What is the very premise upon which your religion is based? And in Joseph Smith's first vision, the very first revelation he received from God, at least in one of the ten versions, um, <laughs> He had prayed to God to ask which Christian denomination to join, and he says, I was answered that I must, must not join any of them, or join none of them, for they were all wrong, and the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, and those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach the doctrines and commandments of men having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, and he forbade me joining any of them. So according to Mormonism, Christianity is a cult. I mean, Christians have considered Mormonism a cult for over a century, you know. Shh, don't tell anyone. But why weren't they asked, well, what's your, your view of Christianity? The very reason your religion exists is because one of the Mormon gods told Joseph Smith that Christianity is a cult and he needs to start the uh, restoration. Now what about Philip Pullman, whose books were turned into the movie The Golden Compass? Well, he writes fun little stories for kids. You know, that's what it is. He says, I was telling a story which would serve as a vehicle for exploring things which I had been thinking about over the years. Despite the armored bears and angels, I don't think I'm writing fantasy. I'm writing realism. My books are psychologically real. And so you see how the worldview is driving, even when he's writing fiction. It's, it's his worldview driving what he's writing. And so he, he says, my books are about killing God. And he also stated, I'm trying to undermine the bases for Christian belief. Okay, so, you know, we see all these fun little books and movies for kids with 
armored bears and fun little stories, but what's behind it? What's the message behind the message? Uh, Worldviews, again. The worldview is driving what he's, he's writing there. How about Dan Brown of uh, Da Vinci Code fame or infamy? He says, how historically accurate is history itself? Okay, but you know he started his book Da Vinci Code with the word fact. And he claims that even though he's writing a fictional story, it's based upon historical facts. But then when he's challenged on those, well, how historically accurate is history anyway? Also, when you want to make a uh, point against Christianity, the history is uh, objective and accurate. But when we want to respond, then, ah, who knows what really happened anyway? Interesting. Think about the show The Office, okay? Uh, One of the characters on that show is an outspoken Christian, and outspoken in a bad way, by the way, just condemning absolutely everybody and everything. And uh, she uh, was engaged to a man, and she was having unmarried sex with him, and also cheating on him by having unmarried sex with somebody else. Behavior so repulsive that even the other members of the, uh, the other employees in the office were just shocked by her behavior. Well, it just so happens that the, one of the co-producers of the show is Ricky Gervais, who's an atheist. Okay, now, I mean, I, I really hate to think in sort of a conspiratorial terms, oh, just because he's an atheist doesn't mean that they wrote that into the show on purpose. Well, maybe not. But listen to what Sam Harris has to say as he looks forward to a time when, quote, making religious certitude look stupid will be exploited and will start laughing at people who believe. We'll laugh at them in a way that will be synonymous with excluding them from the halls of power. I mean, I guess, I guess you've got to have goals. So, <laughs> so he states, I think the criticism of irrationality, I think the criticism of irrationality just has to come from 100, 100 sides at once. In the entertainment community, Maybe you'll just have people making jokes that are funny enough and true enough so as to put religious certainty in a bad light. I'm hopeful that journalists and people in the entertainment industry are waiting for the permission to express their doubts, and I think that permission is coming. I mean, I'm trying to do what I can to engineer it in my hard-handed and boorish way, and I feel, just from the contracts, just from the contacts I have in both industries, that there's a profound sense of relief that comes with hearing somebody call a spade a spade. Okay, so this is uh, activism within entertainment and even the news media to put forth certain secularist, atheist messages out there, anti-religion, anti-Christian messages. Or think about uh, Ricky Gervais, his movie, uh, The Invention of Lying. You know, you watch the trailer for the movie and it was a romantic comedy. Well, he says, I think the reason why critics didn't like it was obviously that the religious elements. I think some people felt cheated when they weren't warned. But I don't know what to do with that. Whether I should put a warning contains atheist material? I don't know. Strange, really. This is one film that dares to presume a lack of God. I don't think it's atheist propaganda. As an atheist, to suggest I believe that religion was started by man. I put that in, the, in, a, in a film. I'd be a hypocrite to say anything else. I make this for me and like-minded people. Okay, so that's another uh, point is the movie trailer was made to portray the movie as being a romantic comedy, but it really, underlying it, was was an uh, atheist message against God's existence. And uh, Ricky Gervais wrote uh, a children's book called Flanimals. And I I took my kids to the bookstore one day, and I, I look over and I go, Ricky Gervais, wow, a children's book? And I go, no, 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 no. come on, no, it's, come on. Sure enough, I'm leafing through it, and there it was. There's a mockery of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam, along with a text that sung the praises of uh, mutation-based evolution and besmirched as mental, exclamation point, the view that all the flanimals were created by a sky being known as Grob. So there it is, anti-creationist, Atheist propaganda, right in a in a children's book. So I mean, obviously, think about it. If you were going to write a movie script or a song or a book, wouldn't you want to put some of your worldview into it to make a certain put a message across? Of course you would. 
And if you say, no, I wouldn't, well, then that's the message you're putting into it, that you're not going to put anything forth. For example, think about the show Seinfeld, which was said to be a show about nothing. And I really never saw how it was any more or less about nothing than most shows, especially comedies, you know, honestly. But the point was, the show's characters were nihilists. I mean, they didn't believe in anything, really. The way they put it within the show is a barren, sterile existence that ends when you die. <clears throat> and that's why, as the Elaine character put it on the show, she was frustrated to pour over the excruciating minutia of every single daily event. But that's what the show was about, was just they were wrapped up in every single little thing that happened every single day, because for them, that's all that exists. That, that's all there is. It's just your daily life, and then that's it. And so that message was in that show. You see that? Now, let's move on to education. And of course, education is based on worldview, the way that the information is put forth. You've heard of uh, Eurocentrism, Afrocentrism, secularism. I mean, it's all about how the information is put forth. It's based on worldview. Phil Fernandez notes that C.S. Lewis, in his prophetic work, The Abolition of Man, critiqued an English textbook written in the 1940s, which was designed for school children. Lewis found that more than English was being taught in this book, for the authors rejected objective truth and traditional values and proclaimed the type of moral, re moral relativism. Lewis express, expressed concerns for two reasons. First, the children who read the textbook would be easy prey to its false teachings. Second, this would lead to a culture built, built on moral relativism and the rejected, rejection of objective truth, something that, according to Lewis, has not existed in the history of mankind. And so you see the point. Within a book about grammar, there's a worldview behind it. There's a worldview um, behind uh, something as apparently uh, worldview-less as teaching grammar. There is something behind it. So now, um, there's a claim out there that atheists, uh, polls and studies show atheists are smarter than the average bear. And... Um, you know, when you, when you run across that sort of research, you always want to think of it in terms of a social scientist. You don't want to just look at the res, uh, conclusions. You want to look at what questions were asked, how they were asked, to whom they were asked, what the responses were. And, and that's how you really figure out what's underlying the conclusion. Now, uh, you know, I work with tons of engineers, and there's a, a stereotype of them that's very true. I mean, they're technically brilliant people. But on the common sense level, <laughs> man, I, so I mean, you know, there's categories, let's say, of smart. You can be very, very, very smart in something and elsewhere, yeah, forget about it. Um, so for instance, you can be very smart, but if you lock your mind, your thinking inside a materialist box, you have disadvantages because you're restricting your thinking to this little box of material possibilities and you're not allowing it out. So that's your disadvantage right then and there. And so why is it that, if it's true, uh, so many atheists are smart? Uh, well, look at our education system is basically an atheist catechism, uh, wherein reference to God is virtually illegal. Uh, if there is reference to God, it's in the negative. And so basically, all the subjects are put forth without any reference to God whatsoever. So if, yeah, by the time you get to college and graduate, like, well, obviously, God is just irrelevant. I mean, no function in history or science or, or anything. We, we just do it all ourselves. And um, this brings me to mention the, uh, something that just burns me up, which is uh, atheist activism on campus, on college campus, which there's a lot of it. And to me, I mean, that's like shooting dead fish with a bazooka in a barrel without water in it. I mean, you think about it, you have the youth, which are naturally rebellious, okay, they're, they're teeming with uh, hormones, shall we say. Uh, they just left mommy's apron strings, they're put in co-ed situations, and along come the atheists and say, oh, they, this Judeo-Christian morality, there's no such thing, you know, it's all relative. Whoa, really? Well, it's, um, if you want me to put it in a brutally honest way, it's basically a modern-day version of temple prostitution. 
right? It's like you'll derive these certain uh, pleasures from holding to our worldview. That's what it is. So let's jump to science. And uh, I wonder if you might take a guess as to who wrote this. Surely, the best way to construct the infrastructure of a bat's wing is not also the best way to build a whale's flipper. Such anatomical peculiarities make no sense if the structures were uniquely engineered and unrelated. A more likely explanation is that all mammals descend from a common ancestor. The historical constraints of this retrofitting are evident in anatomical imperfections. For example, the human knee joint and spine were derived from ancestral structures that supported four-legged animals, or four-legged mammals. Almost none of us will reach old age without experiencing knee or back problems. If these structures were first taken, if these structures had first taken form uh, specifically to support our bipedal posture, we would expect them to be less subject to injury. Incidentally, I'm reading that as I have to sit down when my knee hurts and I have to stand up when my back hurts, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I wonder if uh, you might imagine who might have written that. Um, it actually comes from a college-level biology textbook uh, called Biology from nice Campbell, uh, Neil Campbell and Jane Reese. I mean, this is, this is basically... The point being, atheism isn't being smuggled into the classroom through the back door. It's being brought in right from the front door, right in the textbook that you have to purchase for class. This is college-level biology, and there's an anti-creationist argument right within the text. And it's such a poor argument, by the way. I mean, you know what this means? It means I'm going to sue the, per the, the company that claims to have manufactured my vehicle because they claim that they designed it, but I'm constantly shelling out money for repairs, right? I mean, in essence, the point is they're calling to the question the efficacy of the creator. It's like this obviously wasn't created because it, 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 it has problems. But firstly, you really have to know the purpose of the thing in order to determine whether it's properly engineered or not. For example, you ask any engineer about what they call parts that are designed to wear out, and engineers do that. So you might look at a part and say, look at it, it's falling apart. Like, yes, but we designed it to wear out. I mean, it's supposed to do that. So this is just, again, the point is to consider what's behind what's being put forth, how it's being put forth, what's the message behind it, what's the worldview behind it. And the issue here is that uh, Darwinism is turned by some into a worldview. Okay, you have a theory that is supposed to be about biology, but people turn it into a worldview, and all of a sudden, everything they see is through these lenses, and so they concoct Darwinian stories, you know? How many times have you seen that, where someone's trying to explain some biological function, and you realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're just telling me a story. That's all you're really doing. You're concocting a Darwinian era tall tale, including uh, cryptozoological animals like the common ancestor, as an example of reconstructions. Okay, now this is from a movie poster, Planet of the Apes. You see the whites in the eyes and the, the small nose. Our nose is made of cartilage. I mean, they don't fossilize. So this was an excellent example because they're trying to make this ape look human for the movie. Uh, but here's actual reconstructions of our supposed ancestors, and all of them have these, these sort of tapered down noses, the whites and the eyes, which chimps don't have, to make them look like what the theory says they're supposed to be moving towards. Here's a, the skeleton of Lu Lucy, and you see, I mean, virtually no hands whatsoever, certainly no feet, and not much of anything else uh, there. That's the actual find, that's the actual fossil. And then when we look at the reconstruction, there's the whole being, you know, which, I mean, this thing looks so weird to me anyway. It kind of looks like a platypus. <laughs> but you see, um, there's an entire reconstruction because the theory says it should have looked like this, even if it has no hands and feet. Look at these very human feet. The skeleton, find, the, the find didn't have any whatsoever. Likewise, uh, with the hands, uh, reconstructed to 
to appear more human. So the point being, you have a theory or a worldview uh, interpreting the actual found evidence, and then through reconstructions or paintings or whatever, uh, you can make them look however you want. Next one here is, uh, oh, there's the happy couple. <laughs> I mean, walking in the snow, they must be outside here somewhere. Now, what about Gigantoraptor? Okay, it's a dinosaur illustrated with feathers. And here's what a uh, paper said. Gigantoraptor had long arms, bird-like legs, a toothless jaw, and probably a beak. There are no clear signs as to whether it was feathered. However, judging from its close affinity with other dinosaurs known to have been feathered, Zhu Jing of the Institute of Verver Vertebrae Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing speculates that it was. Uh, Here's uh, Ambulocita natans and then Pachycetus. And you can see if you, if you think that they were a furry land-dwelling creature, th then they were. If you think that they were swimming around, they were. I mean, it's, it's up for interpretation. So Gigantoraptor has feathers in the reconstruction because, well, it's speculated that it did, even though the fossil find did not have them. And so here's another example. The top one's a drawing of the skeleton, what it probably looked like. The middle's the reconstruction, but the yellow portions in the bottom are what was actually found. So you find little bits and pieces, and then you construct it to look what, like what your theory says it should have looked like. Um, so now, P.Z. Myers, who's an atheist and a professor of biology, stated, uh, he was asked, what is most important to you, advancing atheism or advancing the public understanding of science? Or are they kind of one and the same for you? And he said, they're inseparable. Atheism and science are inseparable. Now, I got to give P.Z. Myers at least this much. He's consistent, okay? He states, we are literally soulless machines made of meat, honed by millions of years of ruthless, pitiless evolution. And when it came to uh, uh, pro-life displays, he says, you want to make me back down by trying to inspire revulsion with a dead baby picture? I look at them unflinchingly and see meat. Okay, now, I hate to even have to read that, but, but he's consistent. That's the point. That is his worldview, and at least he's honest and consistent. And that's you know, you got to appreciate that. He sees exactly where his worldview leads, as repulsive as it turns out to be. Richard Dawkins was asked, what is the objective of your anti-religious campaign? And he says, I think my ultimate goal would be to convert people away from particular religions towards a rational skepticism tinged with, no, that's too weak, he says, correcting himself, glorifying in the universe and in life. Yes. I would like people to be converted away from religion to skepticism. So what is happening within the atheist movement with relation to science is really that uh, it's neo-pagan atheism, okay? It's replacing awe in God with awe in nature. It's replacing, what did he say here? Glorifying in the universe, not glorifying in God, glorifying the universe and nature and elucidating its functions, and that's, that's, uh, it's neo-pagan, that's all really what it is. Consider Romans, and I'm going to glean from chapter 1, uh, segments of 18 through 28. Men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculation, and their foolish darks were hardened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the uncorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the last of the lust of their hearts to impurity, for they changed the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind. 
And so what we see is that science is also being turned into a worldview. And it's kind of like if I put on glasses with red colored lenses and all I can see is red and then I come to the conclusion that the only color that exists is shades of red. You see? So science is the same way. Science is meant to explore the material realm. But God is immaterial. So you can't say, well, I'm looking around only at the material realm and I don't see God, so therefore God doesn't exist. But these scientific glasses were not meant to deal with that. It's, it's a category mistake. You have a category of materialism, a category of immaterial, or natural and supernatural. And you can't say, I'm only going to look with these lenses, and then when I don't see that over there, I'm going to just conclude it doesn't exist. You see that? And that sort of worldview thinking is what leads to Richard Dawkins saying, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And Francis Crick to say, biology must, uh, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but evolved, okay? So even when you're looking at the evidence and the evidence is telling you something, deny it, because your worldview will not allow you to accept it. You see that? So do we look for wet evidence of a dry object? No? I mean, we shouldn't look for material evidence of an immaterial being. That, that, that's the point. And so what this leads to is the, uh, the point that the very foundation of science, the, the fields and methods of science, were established upon the belief that the universe was created by a rational creator, a rational God who created a rational creation which could therefore be rationally discerned. Okay, so God creates this material realm, and within it there's cause and effect continuum, and it is because of that cause and effect linear continuum that we can do science. Okay, that's why cultures that had concepts of like cyclical, not time begins and then it ends, but just cycles and cycles and cycles, or cultures that believe that the universe is a, an illusion, that's why they never were able to develop a rigorous scientific method as only came about through the Judeo-Christian worldview. That's why. Because we can base science on noticing these cause and effect patterns and then we can build experiments that are based on that. Uh, so when it is said that bring, quote unquote bringing God into science, oh that's a science stopper is the popular term. It's a science stopper. My goodness, the very foundation of science is God's existence and now it's claimed that it's a science stopper. But why do they do that? Well, because they say, oh, you can't bring God into it. You're saying, oh, we have H2 over here, and we have O over here. How did this become H2O? Oh, gee, I don't know. God snapped his fingers, and that's how he did it. Well, who does science like that? Nobody does science like that. Um, and so I, I've come up with a term, which is material creationism, to make that very point, that no, we don't think the universe is a, a, an illusion, we know that God created the actual material realm, and then we develop science to explore that material realm. But science has nothing to say about what might exist outside of that material realm, period. It doesn't. And so another thing that, another term I came up with is the explanation fallacy. Because, for instance, if somebody asks you, well, how did life come into being? And you say, well, God created it. And they say, well, that's no answer. That's no explanation at all. Well, it, it is a sort of answer. I mean, it's a form of an answer. It's a type of an answer. Uh, there's no such thing as the answer or the explanation. So if then they say, well, I'm asking from a scientific context. I want to know how God did it, and I want a step-by-step -step explanation. Oh, well, that, that's a different category of explanation. It's a different sort or type or kind of explanation. For instance, if we ask, why is my shirt this color? There's a ton of explanations as to why it's this color. We could talk about uh, light and color. We could talk about our brains uh, and vision through our eyes. We could talk about pigmentation in the dye and interacting with the cloth. Uh, we could talk about the fact that I put on a shirt this morning. My wife said, are you wearing that? Here, put this one on. I mean, <laughs> there's, you see, there's a ton of different explanations. There's different levels. There's different contexts. 
There's no such a thing as, well, that's no kind of explanation. Yes, it is a kind. You have to determine what the context is uh, for the, the, the question and then try to base your response upon that. Now, I want to say a word about uh, diversity and tolerance, which uh, is definitely a way in which secularism encroaches upon the culture. Um, now, I wanted to give you as an example this, something that's actually ongoing right now, uh, because my website is called True Free Thinker. A lot of people just automatically assume I'm an atheist, and they'll just, without looking at what I'm presenting, they'll just write me a, an email message. And that always leads to fun stuff. Um, <laughs> So a teacher of world religions class wrote to me uh, asking me to contribute to a book, and he says, I'm writing a book about my experiences and the challenges of teaching religion in public schools. Each chapter will be a collection of letter responses to the following question. What, if anything, should public schools teach children about religion? I've sent this question to a wide range of people, organizations. My goal is to present, publish a cross-cultural snapshot of our nation's diverse answer to this controversial question. So, you know, initially I just asked, well, why a dime a dozen blogger such as myself? You know? It says, um, I'm looking for a diversity of opinion, and I gre greatly respect your blog. I'm looking for people who would logically and critically talk about religion as a possible danger, quote unquote, to mankind, which must also be taught to children. One could certainly argue that the jury is still out as to whether religion has done more good than harm in the world. I hope to have strong representation in my book for those who feel strongly that religion can be a great threat to the advancement of humanity. So I wrote to him, just to clarify, <laughs> um, could we design the book to have the religion as a threat side win, or will it at least be made to appear as if it has a balanced view approach? And he wrote, right now my plan is to have a diverse range of opinion. My goal is to reveal the widening gap between those who cling to superstitious backward faith and those, like yourself, who advance modern scientific thinking. So, so I mean, that's an example of how you've you got to dig a little deeper. You know what I mean? If, at first, it's like, oh, I just want a variety of views. And then I just dug a little deeper and find out, no, he wants to have his book go in a certain direction. So that's an ongoing thing right now with this guy. So um, the way that diversity is taught, it's generally in two forms. One is we're all different, and the point behind that is that, well, nobody's really right then. Everybody just has a view, and they're all equal. Or else we're all the same. And this is when diversity becomes uniformity, uh, which is, you know, we all believe the same kind of things. You know, nobody's different. Now, I used to be in a diversity council for a certain corporation. and I tell you, you never met people with less of a clue about diversity, incidentally. For instance, St. Valentine's Day was coming up, and one of the council members said, well, we need to do something for St. Valentine's Day. Oh, but, but we can't say saint because somebody might get offended. And, and I said, you know, we're the diversity council. <laughs> you know, if somebody gets offended, we explain to them that they should take a diverse view and that not everybody <laughs> believes the same, and it, uh, I mean, it, Mind-boggling, honestly, mind-boggling. Um, and I think, I mean, I think the bottom line is, look, you can respect everybody's right to believe whatever they want, but you don't necessarily have to respect those beliefs in and of themselves. So I want to close by uh, a consideration as to whether there is a purpose to life. Let's say in, a, in an atheist universe, is there purpose? Well, of course there is. Of course. That's because purpose is uh, it's a function. It's a functionality. And, and everything intrinsically within itself, by its very nature, has a function. Okay, so like I show you a baseball bat, you know instantly has a function. You know, it's to hit baseballs or bust some heads. Gabish. <laughs> um, so yeah, everything has a purpose intrinsically as a very part of its nature. Everything has a purpose, even in an atheist universe. But uh, now, does that baseball bat have meaning? Okay, that's a whole different story, okay? That's categories, again, category. Purpose, meaning. They're completely different things, although people often use them interchangeably. They're not. They're completely different things. So I show you a baseball bat and you, you know it has a purpose. 
And then I say to you, you know, this baseball bat, the bat belonged to Babe Ruth. All of a sudden, boom, you place that meaning upon it. Now it becomes meaningful. You see, the, the meaning is not a part of the object's nature. Meaning is extrinsic from without, and it is something bequeathed. There's something we place upon it. So is there meaning in an atheist universe? Well, atheists will tell you, well, we make our own meaning. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that's an admission that there is no actual, true, objective, absolute meaning. They're admitting that. No, 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 we just make something up. Okay, fine. I think the meaning to my life will be I'll be the next Mother Teresa. You know, so that's kind of, well, maybe I'll be the next Hitler, right? I mean, there's no actual meaning to life. Uh, we make up our own. I'm going to make up my own. I think I'll be the next Hitler. You know, that would be my meaning. So we see that meaning is something that is not intrinsic. It's not something from within. It's not something that's natural to the object. It's something from without. It's extrinsic. It has to be placed upon it. And that it is only God that can place upon us that true, that absolute, that objective meaning. It's only God that gives us that actual true meaning. And with that, I thank you.